hello. Yes. So this is Arlene, by the way, uh, from oh. Durian ASEAN. Yeah, hello. Yeah, this very uh, very early morning. So uh, I I got a we got a phone call here from our friend uh, Noraini bin Ramli. Noraina. Uh, Noraina, sorry, bin Ramli, right? Yes. Yeah, and we also have here in the studio three of our friends here. All of you guys are under twenty five. Yes. So today's topic is <laughs> well, sort of under twenty five. <laughs> Uh, let me introduce first. We have Archana uh, from Global Peace Festival Malaysia, and we have Megat Haris from University uh, Islam Antarabangsa or Islamic University of Malaysia, and also our uh, assistant producer of Durian ASEAN, Tan Kim. Hello. Yeah. So the reason why you guys are here because we are going to dissect Malaysia, and according to the youth perspective, which is what do you think? First of all. Uh, before I ask you, you know, complicated questions about politics, economy, education, identity, social, and everything, you know, jumble out under the banner of Malaysia, tell me what is, who, I mean, tell me, describe to, uh, to us about who you are, briefly, and what are the top three issues that you think youth are facing right now. We start with our friend from the Global Peace Festival, Malaysia. Hello, okay, I'm Archana from the Global Peace Festival, Malaysia. So, um, basically, I graduated just last year, September, in psychology from the International Medical University. Then I was just um, finding out what I can do and things like that. And I started Google, Googling for um, an NGO and something to do, something that holds meaning to me. So, that's how I came about finding the Girl Peace Organization. And upon finding out, going for the interview, as most of us, how we'll start out, I... As I get to know GPF more and more, I started falling in love with the values that the the organization promoted, and that's how my life with Gold Peace Foundation started. So now I'm the capacity building officer at the Gold Peace organization. And what are the three issues that you think youth are facing today? Three key issues. Hmm, I would reflect on myself <laughs> as a youth. So um, one would be the economy factor. So being able to afford things. Uh, with our cap- the capacity of earning that we have, and to maybe um, racial issue, racial tension, that's uh, co- in a way causing some kind of split in the society. And three would be, hmm, let's see, having more individuality compared to um, being more in groups, so to say. Yeah, mm. three issues in my opinion. Yeah. Interesting, huh? So we move on to our only male commentator <laughs> <laughs> today. <laughs> uh, his name is Wega Hanis. Yeah. So uh, coming from New City Islam Antarabangsa, uh, Malaysia uh, or UIAM, uh, tell us, uh, you know, uh, introduce to us who you are and also what are the three key issues that youth are facing today. Okay, hello. Uh, good morning. My name is Mega uh, Abdul Al Hanis. So keep short, Mega Hanis. Uh, I'm from International Islamic University of Malaysia uh, in Malay UIAM. Uh, I'm fourth year student, study political science. Uh, I'm on the last semester, and I'm, I'm also uh, an activist uh, in uh, NGOs uh, called TFTN, Teach for the Needs. Uh, I'm a research manager doing some research on uh, education policy and uh, right now we are doing uh, a workshop, weekly workshop uh, leading towards a convention on this May uh, in re- in response towards the PPM, PPPM 2013 uh, to 2025. And for me, uh, the three main issues that are facing the youth today is first, uh, religious intolerance. Uh, second, the hegemonic mentality, and four uh, and three, or uh, the third. The, the hegemonic mentality yeah. among whom? Among all racial. Oh, okay. All racial, <laughs> and three, uh, the cultural dependency. I see. Yeah. So moving on to our own assistant producer Tan Kim during ASEAN. So uh, I I don't know whether you want to describe yourself, but yeah. go ahead. I, 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 I don't think I wanted to describe myself. Like it's nine thirty, we should cut it short. Okay, so I'll just go to the point where what is the issue that I think the youth is facing. So first, I think it's the employment issues. 
and a lot of graduates they were lost when they just graduate like myself last mm. time and not many people like Achana were so lucky <laughs> and that she managed to google the, the, her dream job so that is one of the problem and another is peer pressure mm. we are actually peer having pressure as in like what's up social media ah, okay. like you know Instagram Facebook so ah. sometimes you look at your friends you know they go here and there and then you just feel like okay what am I doing here and then it's you like just keeping up with like, the Jonas's yeah, but the youth Yes, exactly. <laughs> the like the rat race, you like you you feel like you doesn't want to fuse in, but everybody is doing it, and then you are such an outcast if you, if you are not doing it. Mm. So it's another issue. It's quite pressuring, and then the <laughs> third one will be the inflation uh. because uh, back then. I My, think like the, the high cost of living yes, is it? Yeah. Because back then uh, and it, it wasn't consistent with our salary you know. Yeah. Like back then my cousin was having like 2000 per month and now we are still having 2000 per month. <laughs> but everything is like hiking. The price is all hiking. Mm. So okay that's all. <laughs> <laughs> that's cute. <laughs> okay we have here uh, our um, uh, the, the last uh, guest from Sarawak <laughs> Nora Aina. <laughs> So, yeah, describe yourself and let us know what are the three key issues that youth are facing today. I feel so left out right now, just listening to everyone. <laughs> <laughs> um, my name is Aina, um, and I'm, I'm not under 25 anymore. <laughs> oh my god, uh oh. Why are you revealing it, my goodness? <laughs> I have to say that. Very great. Um, and. I'm living in Kuching Sarawak right now. Unlike the rest, oh my God, all of you, like, oh, this is the peer pressure that you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> that is why I'm asking you to come KL, you know. It's a part for every and human part being in <laughs> uh, I was, actually, the kind of, uh, what do you, the three topics, the three men, what is the question again? Issue. The three issues that I was uh, thinking about, actually, like, uh, just the same with what Tanki was talking about. How can you steal my <laughs> issues? <laughs> unemployment is one of the top issues. Okay, so unemployment. What they to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, the li- high cost of living is so it. Even in it's Sarawak high. itself, is the, the cost of living is very high there? Yes. <laughs> uh, can you describe, like, how is it uh, to li- to be a youth living in Sarawak? Uh, I I can say that the pressure is not as um as big as the one that you're ha- you're having in KL. Because there's no uh, toll in Sarawak, right? Yes, exactly. <laughs> they only have big roundabout. What a good life. We're just, we're just pissed off the amount of money that we have to spend for the minyak. <laughs> or oh, the the uh, the petrol. Yes, yeah. but then for the gas the petrol for the car, is it? Yeah, mm-hmm. but uh, I'm guessing that part of other things it's more into the idea that uh, we are unemployed. Mm. There's hard to be employed, so people seems like they're l- losing themselves. They don't know what they want to do in life, and other than that, they need to do something because they need to have their own house. They want to have their own life. Mm. You need money. I so. see. Okay, since uh, unemployment is sort of like the key issue today among all four of you guys, mm-hmm. we're going to start our discussion on youth unemployment in this country. My first question, what is your view on youth unemployment in this country? Why do you think uh, contributes towards youth unemployment? And why does the, your, I mean, the salary is stagnant? I mean, just uh, throw in your, your views. Okay, for my perspective, uh, because I'm not an economist, I don't know the exact figures of the. It will take you years to be yeah. an economist. It's okay, we accept just, your view. Uh, yeah. Well, so I'm just uh, saying through the um, uh, mentality of the youth, uh, because in, in Malaysia, despite of the fact that we, Im- we uh, import a lot of foreign labors to work in our various sectors in Malaysia, you see, uh, ve- uh, you see Bangladeshis and Pakistani and all other foreign labors are uh, uh, filling our market. In, in Malaysia, you see they are in service, uh, service, uh, they are see in, in, you see them in, uh, hotels, you see them, uh, food industries. So it makes our mentality of our youth becoming, uh, 
more selective in their job. Uh, they prefer to be unemployed rather than have a job, a temporary job, just for the sake of uh, having, a yeah, having a job. I see. For a while, before they're pursuing their dream, because they are not really uh, have... You know, have passion in what they do, and yeah. Why do you think? Uh, maybe Archana, why do you think uh, young people do not have passion in you know all these jobs? Since you have passion in your job, so <laughs> I want to know why some people do not have passion in their jobs. Okay, speaking about passion, I think everyone has passion in something. So that is an issue by itself because when you have your own passion, and probably it's identified or not identified when it's not identified then you tend to probably drop hop or not settle in because you're not happy with what you're doing and when you identify your passion you're not going to settle for something lesser than what your passion is so this is where it comes in you know your job whether you're going to take the job that you get or you're going to keep looking for what you want or you just linger around until you figure out what you really want in life. So, yeah. so do you guys think that this is something natural, you know, for young people to figure out life's, you know, biggest question, yes. what kind of job I should do? Again, <laughs> again I would like to say Atana is one of the very lucky ones to <laughs> actually find her passion, you know. Mm. By the way, I think it can drag on to a very long story, but yeah. through the, actually, I think it, it we can blame the educations. Because we were, we were spoon fed. We were spoon fed. We yeah. doesn't know what passion is. We yeah. only know what is given by our teachers, our parents. Like, okay, you should be like this, and then like what after you have graduates, and then what you should study. And even those kind of education expo, you go there and they tell you, okay, you should be a nurse. You know what is it? Uh, what is the advantage? So they already like nurse? lay out the path yeah. to yeah, you, and, and you just have yeah, to yeah. follow. Yeah, you just feels like, oh, it's quite cool, and then I'll I'll study nurse. Oh. And yep. after you graduate, you are like lost. Like, mm-hmm. huh, I think I, sh- I wanted to be a doctor <laughs> But oh my goodness, like, I, I, yeah, I think doctor is cooler But what yeah. to do yeah. I, was, I was so like spoon fed Like so used to be spoon fed mm-hmm. And then I just got used to it mm-hmm. So, so yeah. Uh, yeah I mean uh, What about you Nora Aina uh, um, You're a freelancer A graphic designer I, I don't know whether it's a job that you Are happy to be in Or you you know you sort of like lingering around Yeah to act She's also a henna artist. Oh, okay, that's cool. <laughs> Which I think is quite cool. <laughs> I, I like, I love art. Uh-huh. That's why I took uh, fine art. That's why I took graphic design. So, um, it's not something that's unfamiliar for me to do. So, I'm guessing that, actually, I'm into this business because, one, there are people who need graphic designer, um, the one that they can have, they can afford, which is kind of me. Uh... <laughs> Mm. And <laughs> it's like it's like people need me, though, so I'm I'm there to do what I can do. Mm-hmm. It's not exactly as passionate as before, like when you were studying. And I could say that for this part, I I do blame the education system. Mm. Uh, ah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Why do you blame the education system? <laughs> you know, it's like since you're a child, people uh, tend to. Put a mindset that that you are going to school, you are going to school, and then when you go to school, you study shit. <laughs> you go to some really stressful events, and that's what you keep focusing on since day one mm. exams. So in life, it's not like that. We we have um, there are skills that can be developed that mm. doesn't get developed during the early age, mm. which is childhood. Yeah. So people are messed up when they're turning youth. I see. I, I want to put a focus on salary here. A lot of people are complaining that the salary has been stagnant for years and years, and even for decades. Yes. Um, why do you think this phenomena is happening? I think we should blame the education again. <laughs> yes. Because education, like, like we we doesn't have that much of graduates, you know, back then. Like, you need to study, like, so hard to get your master. But now, everybody can be master. Everybody is, like, holding degree. All of my friend is holding the degree, ho- yeah. the degree search. So, it's like, we are producing massive graduates. So, we are putting 2,000. Okay, you don't like it, then you don't work here. I can hire another degree holder yeah. because there's so much of degree it's holder. Like here. supply over demand. Yeah, so mm. what can we do? We are like, mm-hmm. okay, lah, more supply over la. demand. Just, just, oppress. just to add on to Kim, mm-hmm. I think this is where creativity comes in. Mm-hmm. Because, I mean, no offense to all graduates, I'm a graduate as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, probably what, what the employers are looking for is something that maybe we don't have. Probably a creativity aspect. 
It's because from young, when we go to school, this institutionalized teaching, it teaches you in a way where you absorb, absorb, absorb. Yes. And if you were to say something out of the line, in the sense that something which is different from page five of the moral textbook, for example, <laughs> then you are wrong. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the teacher is not yes. going to ask you why you said <clears throat> so. She's not, she or he is not going to give that avenue for you to think and reflect on the things that you are saying or the things she's teaching you. But more of absorbing simply you know what yes. she's teaching you yeah. so this just inhibits your creativity even your born creative for example it, it's just going to be suppressed yes let's and, blame the education and again and for years, <laughs> years it's just going, going to go yeah. on and on and on and by the time you graduate but how, how do you <laughs> address but how do you address the issue on salary I mean Megat do you, do you? Uh, I think to put into perspective like uh, mm-hmm. what she said before uh I think uh, it's part of the fact that you have, uh, you know, inflation of uh, undergraduates. Yes. I think uh, in the global competitive world, uh, we are being pushed towards uh, improving our <laughs> skills more than ever. Uh, if before this, uh, if we you only master one language, it's okay to get a job. Now, you, maybe you probably need to have two or three foreign languages. So master. the world is becoming much more competitive. Yeah, much more competitive. You need to push. For me, uh, because I'm not graduate yet, graduated yet, <laughs> Uh, just uh, I have another last semester, so maybe if I, do, I didn't get a job because of my skills are unwanted or just undervalued, I don't blame. I'm not literally blame the digital system. <laughs> I'm blaming myself because what do I do? Uh, for for the, four years in the education system in the university, just uh, sitting in the class, listen to lectures. Although there's a lot of opportunity, there's a lot of activities, uh, there's a lot of communication skills, all sort of opportunities you can learn out there. I think, I think a lot of people succeeded from the same broken education system we are talking about. <laughs> A lot of people feel so. I think. But how can you justify, you know, in in a way where people coming from um from better classes, you know, like middle and upper class, they don't have to put that much effort compared to people probably from uh the the rest of the Malaysian uh, youth. But they are able to climb out the, you know, salary ranks, the social ranks, as well as, you know, to get, as well as get better jobs. In a way, do you think it's fair for you guys? Uh, I think it's not fair. <laughs> <laughs> because if you get a, maybe like uh, an Australian, uh, Australian, Australian degree, then you get a different, different salary. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, they usually look at it that way. They wouldn't say like, okay, uh, just, I think I will look at your performance first before I, I set, set up your salary. Usually they will just look at, okay, where you are from. Mm. I mean, this mm. is for, I, I, I think Achara has some say for it. But, but, um, this is for the majority company, yeah. seriously, yeah. because I have friends who work in, uh, uh, as a HR, so I know. Yeah, so I they actually look that. at, mm-hmm. okay, which university you are from. Do, do you ah. think it's fair? I mean, to, to be assessed by your university it's rather to- than yourself? Totally unfair. I mean, you could be coming from a local university, but you might be a really smart student. It's just that you come from a, probably a lower, you know, social economic background. Yeah. So, uh, Aina, do you have anything to add on? Um, somehow I feel like I, I shouldn't blame education system anymore. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay. Uh, we, we hear you. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm guessing that in the point where we are saying, uh, the, the salary is not enough. It's because of our lifestyle, because of yeah. we're living in, in a lifestyle that need more money. So <laughs> for that part, uh, I, I'm guessing that I should believe to the Blanjawan, the budget, and because they're not doing it uh, to help us as a citizen, as a person who might not have that much money. Mm. Uh, so I'm guessing that if if they put down the price, they they just stop increasing everything. The money that we have could be enough. I see. Uh, anything to add on from you guys from what uh, Aina has said? I think it can be another solution where you doesn't have to raise our salary, you just have to lower down the living cost. <laughs> ah. So it's like yeah. okay, like like the same thing lah. Yeah. And not not only that, probably the delivery of um the education system, how you deliver in classes, that could be improved. Mm-hmm. Because that could 
help with how we think you yes, know? Yeah. and that will work a long way I think, I think you raise a very important uh, issue because the reason why uh, youth from you know uh, upper middle class to up, uh, upper class are going on really well in their lives even though they don't need do not need to put as much effort as the normal you know youth in Malaysia partly is because they are receiving top quality education yeah. so in terms of equality opportunity is not a level playing field mm. as in like you are you are receiving re- a really crappy education but even though you are a really smart student and at the same time you want to be better than them but you are just you you cannot go there as as further as what these kids from uh, upper middle class and upper class are receiving uh, you know are starting in a sense the starting point is not the same mm-hmm. I think government will have a say on it. They will, say, they will be saying, oh, we will be giving scholarships, you know, but then scholarship will only be given to a very, very small group of people, mm, yeah. which doesn't benefit all of the smart-ass students, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, please bring a government fight speaker. <laughs> Yeah, we should bring a you from the government, right? <laughs> to discuss about our future. Uh, yeah, talking about the cost of living, we're moving on from unemployment to salary to the high cost of living. How is it uh, living uh, in our case here in the studio, living in Kuala Lumpur with the kind of pocket money that you have or mm. salary that you have uh, as as the younger generation here as well as in uh, Sarawak? Uh, yeah. Maybe start with the Sarawak first. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have to say, I am unemployed. No, okay. no, uh, so, um, my cost, and I still live with my parents. So, mm-hmm. in this case, I'm safe because my dad works hard. <laughs> uh, and my dad is in government agency. Mm. So, uh, for the living cost, I'm guessing that yeah, I, I'm in trouble this time. <laughs> <laughs> Is anybody I mean, going to save Aina? <laughs> <laughs> <No. laughs> So when you say that uh, you cannot afford the high cost of living in Sarawak, so what is your daily expenditure if you can describe to us? Mm, when I'm feeling a little bit uh, tight on the budget, mm-hmm. I can just spend nothing a day. Like what did you do? Just uh, being at home or what? I can go out because there's oil in the tank. There's petrol, <laughs> and I have friends who work, so I'm guessing that they they'll help me out. But um, if I'm going to spend for a day, it could be around sixty ringgit to hundred, just because I feel like so. But mm. it doesn't doesn't feel like I'm in debt so much because of that part because. I'm still living with my parents and all. And I, I don't have any responsibilities like kids. Ah, oh, okay. Thank goodness, right? <laughs> you guys are not married. <laughs> Uh, okay, maybe um, from the KL here, I think you guys feel the pinch much more stronger yeah. than the rest. Maybe mm-hmm. Megat can start with. I think start. as a, as a man, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to get married soon. I'm going to get married soon. I think the burden is much more on the guy lah, mm-hmm. um, because uh, high cost of living. Uh, yeah, and and, and also. Uh, this is the perspective that it, we need to be concerned about. Uh, if you talking about uh, you want to get a stable life in which you want to buy a house, a car, then uh, in KL it will be not it will be not possible. It will be impossible. But if you're talking about living your life decently, uh, maybe you're staying in the village or pursuing your dream, maybe you like to traveling. Uh, so you just have enough. Uh, Decent uh, uh, rent house, and uh, you travel. You lose. You you, you use a lot of your money to travel. You lose uh, a lot of your money to to. I mean, uh, understanding your life better. I mean, you separating your life from the urban uh, city or the urban lifestyle. I think. I think uh, it, it will be more. Um, uh, it will be more easy or. It will be more happier if you choose that kind of life. So, a less, uh, a less materialistic <laughs> life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just our friend here from Sarawak. A less materialistic life. But yeah. in KL, like, everything requires money. Like, how do you, how do you spend your money and where do you get your money? 
Uh, as a student, I'm not yet uh, be part of the working force. Uh, mm. So, uh, I'm a PTP holder. I see. So, um, I have one chance left to get my uh, BIA Siswa if I have... Scholarship. Had, eh? Yeah, scholarship. Mm. If I get 3.5 and above. Uh, so, uh, wish me luck first. And Good luck. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> uh, and um, for me, uh, despite the fact that uh, I always complain that I don't have enough money when I when I contemplate on my spending, I think uh, I spend much more money on my food and clothing, expensive stuff, going out with my friend, watching movies. I think that's a lot of, uh, in which I can say, consumerist society, in mm-hmm. which I'm part of it. Uh, that driven out all your energy and money towards uh, wasteless uh, things. Mm-hmm. Peer pressure. So, yeah. <laughs> Peer <laughs> yes. pressure. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, it's part of this uh, capitalistic consumer yeah. society where we need to live up to the standard of living yeah. where everybody we see as living yeah. it, right? Mm, mm-hmm. yeah. so because, because I have a lot of my friends around me. I mean, like... They even though they don't have the money, they they would come from a poor family. Mm. Just because of peer pressure, peer pressure, they they want to living up to the status and want to show the friend, oh, I got the money, I can treat you all. Just pretending that to be accepted into the society, I think mm-hmm. that's very bad. Mm-hmm. That's how capitalist system. Yeah, push let's you. blame the education system <laughs> again. <laughs> <laughs> like even even parenting lah. Mm-hmm. Like if you keep on giving monies to your kids, like okay, and then they keep asking for it, and then they didn't know that you need to work hard for it. Then, because I think there are necessities, think there are necessary uh what money that you should spend. Like uh, I accidentally just bought a car, like because I really couldn't <laughs> be, accidentally. I, how did I, I mean, <laughs> Because I think that uh, it's, it's, it's cheap and then I think I should buy it and, and now I'm suffering. But then <laughs> it's a different matter. Yeah. Like, but you, you really need a transport system, you know. Like, my God is still okay, like, still studying. Like, but after that, <laughs> yeah. after you graduate, like, what can you do in KL? Like, if you want to rely on the, the public transport system, which I think a lot of people rely on it, but it's really susah nak tahan lah. Like, if yeah. you want, you want, I have been waited for three hours for a bus, public bus before. Three, three hours? Three hours, man. It's like, yeah. I don't know what am I doing? But then, I have no choice. So, uh, in fact, it's not just about the consumerism that we should blame. In fact, uh, it's the lack yeah. of good in, uh, public infrastructure yes, yes, yes. has also dri- dri- driven us ah, to spend money on things are, like cars. Yes, they are actually promoting us to live a life that is more luxurious. It's mm-hmm. not that I wanted to have a car and yeah. then sit inside the aircon and drive. It's not like that. It's so jam in KL. But, but the public system were not, were not perfect. Yeah. We're, we're not actually good at all. Mm-hmm. So there's nothing they can do. I see. Yeah. Um, what about you, Ashana? Did, mm-hmm. did you feel the pressure of, you know, spending? Oh, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, I just started working, right? So it's what now? Yeah. Um, six months is going seven yeah, months. Yeah, me now. too. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I'm slowly like trying to, I am uh, slowly, um, uh, how do I say, spending things from uh, using my own money compared to using my parents' money. Because mm. previously it was them who was funding me, you see? Yeah. <laughs> so now it's me using what I can afford to. Yes. So at times, um, I run out of budget and right. that's why my parents <laughs> come in. But it, they come in with, you know, proper advice and everything. Mm. So of course I feel a pinch because at times I don't want to spend but I have to spend a bit more to go... Uh, uh, further distance for for an event, for example. Mm. So even those small things makes big difference. Yes, in like uh, a long run. Exactly. <laughs> like if you got lost and then you have to pass the toll again, oh, you are that like, my goodness. So many times. <laughs> my goodness. What am I supposed to? Do? I don't want to give this money. My God. But yeah. you took Yeah. I but mean, I don't mind the learning getting lost, right? <laughs> but the pinch in the pocket is quite hard. <laughs> yes. I see. How do you think that the government can do to sort of like reduce the cost of living, especially for the younger generation? Should they provide some sort of like free access to certain uh, public infrastructure or public goods? Or yes, a- should. any any yeah. suggestion yeah, that you can come in? They should improve. Uh, they should improve the uh, public transport, yeah, public transport mm. in order, yeah, to remove people or to reduce the pressure of having a sort of luxurious things. Uh, as a substitute yeah. yeah I agree with Magat because that's one of the simplest things that they can do to increase the efficiency of the mm. public transport system because mm. when you do that then probably most of us will be able to use the public mm. transport and be on time and for things and mm. such 
and uh, you know maybe we can even reduce carbon emission <laughs> but yeah because, yeah. 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 because yeah. if, if we, and then there, there's more car is more jam and then when it's more jam you use up more petrol yeah. 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 so it's like a recycling things and yeah. but in in Sarawak the Sarawakian youth uh, uh, when you talk about high cost of living you're you're particularly targeting like which part of the sector or you know areas I have just, uh, I have to say it could be the payment for housing mm-hmm. and the petrol. But actually, while listening to all of you, I feel like my life is way better. <laughs> <laughs> Don't show up. I'm only thinking about all the toll that I doesn't have to pay. Yeah, if you get lost, you just go, go around and then maybe you have to delete a, a bidayo Oh my God. Yeah. Going from A to B for this place, and that B would be so far away, yeah. like other districts. But yeah. but staying at the other place, and I'm I'm guessing it's because of the amount of cars that you guys have over mm, there. Yeah, it's the city. Mm. But when you talk about high cost of living, in particular in areas like Sarawak, which people uh, people like us from KL might not be that familiar, where do you think uh, you know the cost would be? Usually, mm, the uh, the big city would be Kuching and Miri, mm-hmm. and I could say Cebu, but uh, still toler- tolerable. Mm-hmm. And for uh, uh, what is how do you call it in English? Kawasan Pedalaman. Oh, the inner uh, uh, rural areas. Mm-hmm. Sub sub burn sub uh, uh, that place uh, that area are um, more covered because I live there. For five years, six years, and I'm guessing that my life over there was way. Um, how do you say it? It doesn't really need that much money. Mm. I, I can if I can be happy, and I don't need that much of items. I don't need to um, buy stuff. Comparing when I'm in city. And then how do you get food? <laughs> Pancing ikan. <laughs> what? <laughs> How do you get food then? If you don't, you, you, what do you mean by you don't you don't spend that it much of food? It doesn't cost as much. Yeah, oh. yeah. I think it, the, the, if you compare to Kuala Lumpur, like maybe a plate of rice with some vegetables, it would probably be costing less than in Kuala Lumpur. How much is it a plate of rice with maybe two vegetables and one meat would cost in Kuala Lumpur? I mean, for you guys. Uh. For me, in my university, it's quite cheap. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if it's because of subsidy or not. But uh, it's only f- the about 3 ringgit and 50 cents. What about in... Yeah, so in, in the normal restaurant? I think a pretty decent uh, plate of rice with two dishes. And three plus three one meat. plus yeah. one meat. Yeah. It actually go up to six something, seven actually. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Depends on where you have it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like in Mama, it could be quite expensive. Yeah. You know, oh, Mama, yeah. like it yeah. might be goes, it might goes up to eight or nine ringgit. Mm-hmm. If you yeah. have like three veg- veggies and then one meat. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What about in Strawa? Uh, some people say that it is uh, more pricey than the one in KL, but I'm... How oh, much would well, how much would a plate of rice with a few vegetables and one meat cost? Mm, actually, I never bought a side thing. <laughs> <laughs> you eat at home every day. <laughs> I can, uh, but this, uh, but I'm guessing that if you buy it at a place, um, the one young fancy, then you have to pay more around eight ringgit. But if you go to a place young, more like a normal restaurant, you know, yeah. like everyone would go during lunchtime, you know, those kind of restaurant. Yeah, it could be less than. Five it? Less than five. Oh. So it's the same cost as the price of yeah. your university. <laughs> so I yes, want to be in my university. university. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So uh, moving on to the next topic uh, is about uh, the the second. I, I think you said uh, a lot of times it's about religion and uh-huh. the hegemony uh, oh, minds. Yes, yeah. uh, first of all, do you think Malaysia should be an Islamic state? No. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let's hear the opinion from both Mus- Muslim, which is Mega and also Aina. Uh, oh yeah, we've got a very nice uh, mix of <laughs> So Aina, what, what about you? Um, I don't think that uh, it will do Malaysia good to have itself declared as an Islamic country. 
uh, a part of the fact that our country belongs to multiracial citizens who believe and embrace different religion. It is also due to the idea that we are not currently have Islamic leader. We have a Muslim, a Malay, but in Islamic sense, we are terribly lacking. So I'm guessing that it, our past, I mean, uh, Islam, uh, based on Islam history, Islamic history, most of the leader are not only a Muslim, but they live in a lifestyle that you can see that that is Islam. Um, so it's okay for them to not to bring that kind of lifestyle to their what they call tanah jajahan or their government uh, colonized areas land. Uh, not not really it? tanah jajahan. It's more like the place that they are leading. Because they are who, they, they seems like they're fit for that. But um, this is what I was thinking last night, which is, I don't think that our our leader is Islamic enough I to see. do that. <laughs> oh, so you are saying that it's con- conditional because we are not prepared yet due to uh, the, the the level of Islam Islamicity of our leaders. Is that is that what you mean? We don't have suitable li- leaders. I see. For that. Mm. Uh, Megat being someone who totally opposed Islamic <laughs> State, what would your because, view be? Uh, because I, I believe in the secular state in which, uh, you know, when you talk about secular, it has uh, various interpretation. So I t- I'm talking about a decent secular, not extremely secular like uh, what Kamal Atatuk did with, in Turkey in 1924. It's just a secular that separating uh, religion from the state affairs in order to maintain the, the, the religious uh, tolerance. I think. I I think this is that that is very uh very uh simple and very easy to understand that uh the only way to in to the only way to maintain a multi a peaceful uh, coexistence of multicultural society or multi religious society is to put secular into to, to put the state into a secular condition. Uh if you mean uh make hmm. sure that the the state the religion do not have any yeah, yeah. sort of interest yes, within yes. the state. Yep. I, I want to throw a I want to be a devil advocate here. Uh, uh, f- uh, yeah, yesterday I saw a news uh, from France where um, the, the, one of the uh, politicians, leading politician in France, saying that you know uh, Muslim or the Jews there should just say should just eat pork and or go hungry uh, in the school. Uh, these Muslim kids in, uh, and Jewish kids in this uh, in the school because she uh, she said that. This is a secular country. We do not accept religious belief, you know, to to be part of the state, you know, uh, way of dealing things. And public school is under the jurisdiction of the state. So do, this is a more extreme view of yeah, secularism. Do, do you share this sort of view? No, no, no. I think it, I think it's uh, a direct intervention of the state into religious affairs. That's not secular for me. Uh, because when you talk about secular, it comes from two different traditions. One for Anglo-Saxon American, which is very soft, uh, secular. The one came from French Revolution, which is the secular in, 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 in its extreme level. I think, uh, the one that has been done in France is very problematic, in which they interfere into the very foundation of freedom of expressing their own religion. Mm-hmm. So, uh, the state itself has interfered into the, into the uh, public affair so it is not really secular at all so I think uh, it has the kind of hegemonic uh, imposition towards the minorities I think See, yeah very interesting uh, even though this is uh, a, you know a topic on Islamic State we do want to hear the voices of you know our <laughs> non-Muslim sisters here or I shouldn't call non-Muslim we should just say uh, we are Malaysian every issue is our issues you know so uh, starting with maybe Tan Kim first uh, when you talk about Islam like what is your view on Islam and do you think an Islamic State is adjusted? I think it's Islam itself is a religion, which I I don't have any any comments on it. Which I think every every religion uh, promotes peace and promotes humanity among humans. So I think it's a good thing. It's just that uh, I agree with both Aina and what Megat says. Oh, okay. We doesn't have a great Islamic leader. So because a lot of things in uh, in every religion, it 
actually based on personal interpretation mm. what from whatever is written it may be the Al-Quran mm. or the Bible or any kitab kitab the, the Buddhist <laughs> kitab so so when you doesn't have a great Islamic leader, they might interpret it wrongly. Yeah. Like what the, 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 just now, the France one. Like I think it's just some, there are some crazy people who came out with some crazy statement like that. Like saying, okay, the France is like secular yeah. and then that you, yeah. you should go and eat pork. Like yeah. it's crazy. Like crazy. this is still my religion. It doesn't have to do, it, it doesn't have anything to do with, uh, the government. Yeah. So uh, the, with the Megat's points, I think it's quite, um, valid. Pres- uh, valid too because it's like, when things, um, when the religion came into politics, things always go ugly, yeah. I think. Mm. Like, even with race or so, it's yeah. the same thing. I see. Maybe, Archana, you can chip in, you know, whatever views that you have about yeah. this issue I in Islamic I agree with state. my fellow Malaysian friends here. <laughs> 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 so, um, I think the issue in Malaysia is, not only in Malaysia, I think in most countries, Religion is being politicized. Yes. So when you politicize religion, everything just looks wrong from the perspective mm. of religion. Yeah. But in my point of view, religion is beautiful. You know, it teaches you the right things, the yes. right values, the right practices. But when it's being politicized, you know, for it's for somebody's personal agenda. So when they have a personal agenda, they put in their um or whatever. Motive. Yeah. Subtext. Mm. Their, their own motive inside and try to play things around. That's when it messes up. Um, the people in majority. So, so how religion should be in, uh, within the state? I mean, within society, how it should be seen, uh, especially on religious leader. H- how do shape? How do? How do they? How can they play a role within society where they are not being seen as imposing it on others, but trying to preach peace? Mm. I think they they have no other duty than to promote peace. I see. Other than to promote peace and love between fellow Malaysian, I think they don't have the right to say anything. Values, yeah. 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 So they shouldn't be in politics. Is yeah. that what you mean? Yep. So you don't agree with uh, like Islamic-based political party yeah. like PAS? <laughs> I, I don't agree with the agenda, but I don't, I don't, I don't deny the existence as, as a balancing, to balance You're the power safe. between people. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even a party member, lah. <laughs> uh, I mean, Aina, you can say anything if you want to. Uh, yeah, but okay, no, no, nothing about past, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I never really see the the need for the politician to be in, to intrude our life with their uh, with uh, religious ideas because mm. once uh, what we know is that um, there is we can educate ourselves when it comes to religion because we, uh, like for Christian you go you go to church and then for Muslim that they can go to the mosque there are people who can in a way help that community out without having politics to be to intrude their life mm. and actually <laughs> go ahead this kind of thing I don't see that it is a problem here here people can live in the same house uh, the mother can be Christian and the kids can be Muslim I see here meaning in Sarawak is it? Exactly. In oh, Sarawak. is that it's how is it possible? Uh, because you know, you we are all under the same sort of like uh, Islamic uh, Islamic law in Malaysia. How is it possible to have you know those kind of uh, interfaith um, families or marriages? Um, okay, if you, when you're talking about interfaith uh, marriage or mixed marriage. When someone's mar- uh, marrying a Muslim or Muslim marrying someone who are not uh, the same re- uh, religion, uh, the rule out uh, in Malaysia it would be that the other person have to convert to Islam. That's something that everybody knows, right? Yeah. Uh, and it seems like in Sarawak, it's not that uh, it's not that other religion can accept that uh, when their kids changing faith. It's just that. Uh, they understand that those religion exist, and if the kids, if um, for example, um, uh, if, if I'm not a Muslim and I want to become a Muslim, that that could be my decision, whether I'm doing it for married or for not. And what I like, what what I have here, what what I've seen so far is that um, 
it's it's a relief. It, it's not it's not something that make you become no longer family members. So it's not some kind of divorce. It still make you who you are. It's just that now you're um, praying to different kind of God with different kind of routine. So in a so, sense, everybody should have the freedom to profess whatever religion that they want to profess, yeah, yeah. or even not having religion at all is yeah. their own personal and private um, decision, right? It's not the state exactly. decision. So, you cannot force someone to believe in God if they're not believing in God, right? Yeah. It, it, yeah. it would be so weird, like, it would be so fake. And then <laughs> you really didn't want it to be. Yeah, I mean, we can see nowadays, like, a lot of people are, are sort of, like, living a life that that is uh, being determined by the government mm. or the state or even the religious department on, or even mm. their community on how they should lead their life rather than what they think is best for them. Yes, I think it's like if you are they, they even determine your race mm. it's yeah. like okay I'm a, I'm, I'm a mixture of an Indian and Malay and uh, Chinese so what should I put in the in the column mm. like what should I put <laughs> yeah <laughs> Like a lot of people ca- are coming from bi- uh, biracial or multiracial yeah. parentage, so yeah. I think to to add to the point, uh, because uh, for Malays, uh, for majority Malay, Muslim Malays, they are very they are being apologetic uh, in which to refer to all tradition in which uh, this is tanah Melayu and also that. I think. Uh, uh, evolution occurs throughout civilization, throughout um, I mean particular nation state, and and we develop a new social contract uh, contract together. I mean if if uh, in the old days we are only Malays sitting uh, living in this po- kind of population, now we have a mixture that create a new I mean a new kind of breed of culture, a new kind of uh, community. very community. fusion yeah. uh, fusion I would say of culture moving from religious tolerance to Acceptance. Yeah, yeah. acceptance. Why acceptance. tolerate? You yeah. know, be more acceptive. Yeah. yeah. Because because yeah. you can see in, in the mainstream uh Malay Muslim community, they're still talking about uh, how to interact with non-Muslim? Yeah. Uh, I can It doesn't make sense. We shouldn't look at each other <laughs> like that way. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What was it you want to say, Aina? It's like uh like those people who have different beliefs, they become somewhat alien to us. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. true. We uh, need to teach them how to yeah. communicate together. Like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, unfortunately, this is the the end of our session today. But I think the discussion is pretty heating, uh, heated, and I think we we should hit hit it up again. You know, on the next one, mm-hmm. um, definitely we will have. Uh, a continued discussion on different areas uh, that our youth hear things. So uh, this is Arlene from Durian ASEAN. We will continue again on more issues uh, on politics, economy, education, identity and social and so forth. And see you. Goodbye. Bye. 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 Bye.